Hello, everybody. Yes, um, I, I indeed was a zombie hunter for the US government, but we'll save that for the game that we are gonna play after my talk. That game is called Ask Me Anything. And I started tweeting it out. Literally, it's a game I love to play with people that you have a futurist in front of you. You can literally ask me anything. I have been asked everything from when will the, the robot apocalypse happen to is there a way that we could attach jets to the equator and somehow slow the rotation of the Earth so we could have a 30-hour day. <laughs> it's all open. But what I wanted to talk to you about now is this notion of humanity and the machine. We're talking about designing the future and thinking about the future. And what I want to talk to you a little bit about is this project. But to set it up, I would like to tell you a little bit about myself, who I am, what a futurist actually does, and why, why do companies have futurists. And then we're going to get into this, this project, which really took me to this, this kind of new way of thinking about the things that we design. So I want to start off, if you read my first slide very closely, it says that I work for a large company and we have a lot of lawyers. OK, good. I did that. We can now move on. OK, who am I? So as I said, I'm Brian David Johnson. I'm a futurist. Um, I do future work for the Intel Corporation. I also do it for the uh, US military. I do it for trade organizations. I do it for startups. Essentially what I do is I look 10 to 15 years out and model what it will feel like to be a human and live in the future. Now I'm a technological futurist and at a company like Intel, they need me because it, at, the, at Intel, it takes about five to 10 years to design, develop, and deploy the chips that we make that go into your computers and tablets and smartphones. So it's of vital business importance today for Intel to know what people will want to do 10 years from now. Um, you all being designers, what I do is basically called effects-based planning, or in the world of design, it's experience design. I design basically a spec. I'm a principal engineer at the company. I design a spec that says, here's how people will want to act and interact with technology, and then we build that out. So you'll find that I'm a very pragmatic futurist in that way. Now, you can pretty much tell everything you need to know about me by looking at this picture that's up on the screen. Now, being designers, you could probably figure out that what I was really talking about is this. And for those who kind of can't see in the back, what this is, ladies and gentlemen, is a calculator watch. So you can rest assured, I am a nerd. I am a huge nerd. I love everything science. I love everything science fiction. And these things come together in the work that I do that is sort of future casting and looking out towards the future. Now, as I said, I'm a pragmatic futurist in that way. So the things that, the visions that I put out there and the work that I do, it's, it's judged on the ability for my colleagues to take action, for us to begin to design these platforms. And so let's talk about the future. Let, let's think about what the future might actually look like. That's where we have to start. You have to have a vision for the future. So typically, when we're shown images of the future, this is what we are shown. Right? We get this in advertising. We get this in, uh, in the media. I'm sure some of you have actually designed futures that look like this. You generally have a very good-looking guy or a good-looking girl. You have a very sleek, streamlined piece of technology. And they're usually in a super cool environment. Now, I have to tell you, I hate this picture. I despise this picture. Because if we are going about doing the real work of designing the future, when I look at this picture, I ask myself, where are the baby toys? Where are the pillows? Where are the family photos? This poor man is alone in the world. Now, when I look at it, at best, I find it sort of intellectually dishonest, right? And from a design standpoint, this is intellectually dishonest. It is stripped down. At worst, I find it insulting. I find it insulting because it doesn't embrace the complexity of human beings. That's what makes us awesome. We have different cultures. We have different religions. We have different beliefs. Right? That's the wonderful thing about us is that we are diverse. And when I see something that looks like this, I find it insulting. And if we actually start thinking about futures that look like this, we are insulting our humanity. We are not embracing the awesomeness that is humans. Now, I can also say that I hate this picture because this picture comes from Intel, which, as you can imagine, doesn't make me a lot of friends in the marketing department. 
So don't tell anybody. Now, on my next slide, I have a picture of what the future is actually going to look like. Who would like to see it? Oh, come on, people, it's Friday. You were all so polite. You actually raised your hands. <laughs> Seriously. Wait, so I spent a lot of time um, talking to young folks. Yes. And I was standing in front of, of, of about 600 people, um, engineers, people who are actually going to do the sort of design of the future. And I'm there, and I'm Intel's futurist, and I say, who would like to see the future? And it's completely silent, except for one kid way in the back who goes, sure. <laughs> I'm like, great, I come all the way here and all I get is, sure. <laughs> OK, so we're going to move. Now before we move to the next slide, I have to warn you. You can't unsee what I'm about to show you. <laughs> Seriously. Mark, your, mark it right now. Your life is going to change. Your life will be measured from, from this slide to the next slide. Literally, a PowerPoint slide has never been this powerful. You will tell your children and your children's children that you actually saw the future. So hold on to somebody. Get ready. Bam! I know, right? Whoa, you felt that. like. No, right, this is awesome, by the way. From, by the way, pound for pound, there's more future in this picture than the last one. She has a laptop, a smartphone, a connected TV, and a, and a connected picture frame. But the, this actually comes from some social science research that we've done in my lab. What I love about this is that it's human, right? She's got stuff on top of her chest of drawers. The drawer's open. She's in her bare feet, right? This is human. This embraces the reality of what it means to be a human. This is the type of future that I want to design for. I want to design for a future of, for real people. I actually want to live in this future. I don't want to live in that previous slide. Let's go back one. I don't want to live in this future because this future looks like prison. I want to live in this future because this looks awesome. Actually, if you look, you probably can't see it, but there's a pillow there that actually says, chill out. So as I'm starting to kind of frame these things, I am trying to imagine futures that are inhabited by real people. And I think as designers, this sets the bar very, very high for what we can do. Now, the work that I do is something called future casting. We can talk about it during the Ask Me Anything or if you want or, or in the break afterwards. It's essentially a mixture of, of social science, of technical research, of economic data, and then global interviews that basically says, we believe that the future is going to look like this in about 10 years. And then it says, what is the future we want and what is the future we want to avoid? Because it embraces the fact that the future is actually built by people that the future isn't an accident. We actually build and design the future. So we say, what is the future we want? What is the future we want to avoid? And how do we get there? What are the steps we need to take today to get to that future we want and to avoid that future we don't want? Now, the thing that has been driving me for about the last, I'd say about six years, is, is captured on this slide. That basically what this graphic says is that as we approach the year 2020, the size of meaningful computational power, the size of the chip that goes into all of our devices begins to approach zero. Today, we are at 12 nanometers. In 2020, we'll be at five nanometers. Five nanometers is 12 atoms across. So essentially, we will be able to turn anything into a computer. We could turn this chair into a computer. We could turn my jacket into a computer. We could even turn my body into a computer. And this fundamentally changes the questions we need to ask ourselves about the technology and the businesses that we are designing. Because for decades, we had to ask ourselves, can we do something? Can we make a desktop small enough to fit onto somebody's lap? Can we take a laptop and make it small enough to fit into somebody's pocket or their pocketbook? But when you have the size of meaningful computational power moving to zero, we don't have to ask can, because we can turn anything into a computer. We have to ask ourselves, what? What do we want to do? And why do we want to do it? Now, one of the things that we know, oh, before I move on, I love this graphic, by the way. I've had it for a while. So can you see the woman in the 1960s? She's got a bouffant hairdo. And the guy in the 1970s has got uh, bell bottoms on. Can anybody guess who's in the year 2010? 
Somebody said Steve Jobs, thus proving that you are smarter than I am. I had this thing for months, and I was actually on stage, and somebody goes, that's Steve Jobs. And I was like, oh, that is Steve Jobs. <laughs> and so I called the graphics guys, right? And I was like, did you know that that's Steve Jobs on my slide? And they went, you know, it took you like weeks to figure that out. <laughs> and then they did the thing that they love to do. They went futurist and hung up. <laughs> OK. so. One of the things that also, with all of this computational power, what it also leads us to is something th that you hear people talk about a lot called big data. And if you ask people what it will feel like to live in a time of big data, and you say, tell me about big data, and they will say, well, it's big. <laughs> and then you'll say, well, can you tell me a little bit more? And they say, well, there's a lot of data in the big data. It's kind of ridiculous. And so I push people to say, what will it feel like to be a human? And for many people, it will feel that data has a life of its own, that it actually has a secret life, because it will have a secret life. You'll have machines talking to machines. You'll have algorithms talking to algorithms. And all of this work will be going on. But we also have to remember that although that will be awesome, because it will do amazing things for us. It will make us more productive. It will make us more sustainable, healthier, happier. It can make us more entertained. But we always have to remember that all those ones and zeros are meaningless until that data comes back and touches the lives of people. That the systems that, that we're designing, that the, the businesses that we're designing, the products that we're designing mean nothing until they touch the lives of people and make their lives better. So you'll find, if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm kind of an optimist, right? I think the future is built every day by the actions of people. We all actually design our future and so why wouldn't we build an awesome future? If we build the future, let's not build a future that sucks. Let's actually work together to build a good future. It just seems logical to me. And so as I was thinking through this, then something happened. This happened. May 6, 2010. I was actually in New York when it happened. This is the flash crash. This was on May 6th. Actually, we didn't really know what happened until May 7th. This is where, basically, I was walking down the street in Manhattan, and I saw the, uh, uh, the headlines. And the headlines read, computers crash the stock market. And I thought to myself, oh, crap. <laughs> and the reason why was because I'm an optimist. And I think we can use all this technology to make people's lives better. But here was an example of the secret life of data, data going off and doing things. This was, um, this was high frequency trading, which we'll talk about in a second. And this was actually hurting people. And so I took it on myself, being an optimist, to say, well, let me dig into this. And so this was the flash crash. And so what happened at the flash crash is from about 2 PM all the way to about 4 PM, we have this massive dip in the Dow Jones. And what happened is, is that the algorithms that were being used for high frequency trading kind of went off the rails. And the thing that scared everybody was that they didn't know why. If you go back and read it, they didn't know why this was happening, and they didn't know how to stop it. And you see, very quickly, it rebounded and it got back up. But it had this sort of deep, deep fear inside of people. And I kind of wanted to scratch on that and go, is there something there? So I started this project called Humanity in the Machine. And I started going out and trying to ask questions. And so I said, well, let me go and look at what's actually going on with high frequency trading. And really, high frequency trading is actually not that big a deal. It's actually just using software to, uh, to trade stocks and trade on different markets. And it actually uses the speed of light to do it, which I found kind of fascinating because, let's be clear, any, any company or industry that uses the speed of light is kind of awesome. I am a nerd, remember? And so the, what was happening, though, is that these were taking over how we traded on the stock market, how they traded. And so I went to them and said, well, how could we do it differently? And the thing that I learned was, number one, the machines didn't crash the internet. The human, I mean, didn't crash the stock market. People crashed the stock market, because people were the ones who wrote those algorithms. The high frequency traders wrote those algorithms. Right, and an algorithm is actually not that complicated. It's pretty much just a recipe, right? You have, it's like baking a cake. You sort of take the, the, wet, the wet part, the dry part, you put it together, you put it in the oven, boom, cake. Basically, it's an algorithm. It's step by step by step to an end. 
And human beings were writing the algorithms. They were actually writing the algorithms to go off and do these things. So it was actually us. We were the ones who were doing it. And so I went and said to the high frequency traders, I said, well, what are you optimizing for? What are you doing here? What are we trying to do? And they're like, well, we're optimizing for profit. Right? That's, our, that's our job. Our job is to maximize profit. It's like, okay, um, could we optimize for something other than profit? Because it turns out, Profit's not that big a deal, right? Profit is just an economic metric. Where, where profit goes wrong is when you bring humans into it. Because human beings are flawed. And human beings get greed. And you can think what you want of greed, but it's pretty much, I think it's number three on the list of things that will send you to hell. So I started saying, can we optimize for something other than greed? And if you start looking at financial markets, a lot of the economists that I work with said that you can begin to see financial markets as a history of panics and crashes. That as long as there is a market, there will be somebody trying to manipulate the market. So it made perfect sense that as we started going through and, and looking at these, I said, well, can we optimize for something other than greed? And I went to an economist that I uh, work with a lot by the name of Paul Thomas, and I said, Paul, could we optimize for something other than profit? And he kind of looked at me and said, Brian, nothing gives economists greater consternation than optimize for anything but profit. He said, it's not great, but it works. And I said, I understand that, but can we do it? And so I talked to the high frequency traders and they're like, yeah, we can totally optimize for something other than profit. We could optimize for quality. We could optimize for sustainability. There's actually now sustainability indexes. And I realized, from a design standpoint, one of the most important questions we can ask ourselves is what are you optimizing for? And it's something that in, in the, the, my design critiques and in the work that I'm doing, I start to ask people, what are you optimizing for? It actually clarifies things very, very quickly. Are you optimizing for profit? Or are you optimizing for something else? And so I started traveling around and asking people, could you optimize for something else? And so I went and I met people who do peer-to-peer -peer lending. These were people who said we were optimizing for the American dream because they were lending to people who banks literally could not lend to. And they wanted to give people access to the American dream. I went and talked to a, uh, a venture capitalist, um, a serial entrepreneur by the name of Crystal Beasley. And Crystal Beasley had seen her friends destroyed by the venture capitalist churn mill, right? Put out as many, um, put out as many companies as you can and get as, get as many to an IPO as possible. And what Crystal said is, well, why don't we optimize, instead of for the IPO, why don't we optimize for people's happiness? The happiness of those entrepreneurs so that we can actually not only get one good idea out of them, but 10 good ideas out of them and actually make them healthy and happy. And then I even started working with folks in the um, American Army, the US Army, where they were actually using smartphones. They were optimizing smartphones to treat soldiers that were coming back from battle who had PTSD, right? An awful, awful um, disability, an awful disease. And the reason why it's awful is it's always there. And your family can't always be there, your doctors can't always be there, but this can always be there. And so the phone could keep an eye out on you. You know, was the soldier moving around? Was the soldier interacting? And if they weren't, it could reach out to a family member and say, hey, you know what, maybe you should reach out to the soldier. Or if it gets really dire, it can reach out to the healthcare system. So you be could begin to see that we could optimize for all sorts of things. And really, it led me to this, that our science and our technology have progressed to the point where what we build is only constrained by the limits of our imagination. Think about that. What we build, the one thing that is holding us back as we design businesses and products, as we design for the future, the one thing that holds us back, the one skill, is not science, not technology, not design, it's our imaginations. It's our inability to imagine a far more awesome future than we have today. And as we start thinking about the humanity and the machine and, and that, that future that we're imagining, what I realized was that everything that we design, we imbue with our humanity. Everything, we, we put ourselves into that design. And it means that we have a responsibility. So I started looking at, as you start to imbue it with our sense of 
culture, our sense of, um, sometimes our sense of religion, sometimes our values, as we put these into the things that we design, we now have a responsibility. Because I started looking at something at the nature of evil. And to say, wait a minute, the, the nature of evil is not some demonic force going out there doing bad things to good people. The nature of evil is actually thoughtlessness. So if we're designing our technologies and our businesses and we're not thinking about what we're doing, and we're not thinking about those consequences, we are actually designing machines of evil. We're actually designing things to be evil. But the other side of that, if we embrace the fact that we imbue our technology with our sense of humanity, and we ask ourselves, what are we optimizing for? We can actually create our better angels. Because we can create the things that we design, they don't have ego, right? We can design them to take care of the people that we love. We can design them to be sustainable. We can design them to care for people. And in that way, the things that we design, if we are present, and we ask ourselves what we're optimizing for, and we're honest, we can actually see these products as our better angels. And they can actually take care of the people that we love and express ourselves. Now, as a futurist, I take my job very serious. And I believe the future is built every day by the actions of people. And so I started asking myself, how do we change the future? So if we have a vision for the future and we want a far more awesome future than we are, than we have today, what do we do? How do we change the future? And what I came to was this, is the way that we change the future is we change the story that people tell themselves about the future they will live in. Really simple, but incredibly powerful. Because if you can change the story that people tell themselves about the future that they will live in, they will take different actions. They will do different things. They will make different purchase decisions. They will make different education decisions. They will make different community and policy decisions. That that narrative and that design of the future by sharing that is incredibly powerful. And I would argue that because you're here, you care about the future. Right? You have New York City just outside these windowless walls, and you made the decision to sit here and listen to me. Thank you, by the way. <laughs> you care. You actually care about the future. And you will design the future. That is what you do as designers. As the, by coming to this conference, you care about that. You will design the future. And I would ask you to do two things. Number one, Always be brutally honest with yourself of what you are optimizing for. What are you optimizing for? What are you designing for? And then number two, I would make the humble ask that when you do that, realize that it's always about people. And to take all of your passion, all of your power, and to think about what you're optimizing for and try to make the lives of people better. Because if we can set the bar really high, we can not only do good design, but we can actually make a much better world. My last slide takes a really quick story. When I was coming up in industry, I used to write speeches for my executives. And one of my executives always had me put a picture of dogs playing poker in every single presentation that he did. I was young, I said, yes, sir. So in every presentation that I did, there was always a picture of dogs playing poker. So there was a picture, you know, if there was a screen on the wall, it was a picture of dogs playing poker. There was a podium, a picture of dogs playing poker. And finally, at the end of my time, I went up to him and said, sir, why do we have to have a picture of dogs playing poker in every single presentation? And he kind of smiled at me and said, Brian, people love pictures of dogs playing poker. <laughs> Why wouldn't you put pictures of dogs playing poker in everything in presentation? So I've taken on this tradition. So in every single presentation that I do, I don't put pictures of dogs playing poker. What I do put are pictures of animals using technology. <laughs> the longer you look at this, the more freaked out you're gonna get, by the way. And with that, I will say thank you very much, and let's play Ask Me Anything. Have a seat. Prepare to be asked anything. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Now, 
It's a little hard after looking at that cute kitty slide. I know, right? And I know we're all supposed to be trusting here and all. But when I hear someone say, machines don't do bad things, people do. It, it, it does remind me a lot of guns don't kill people, people do. Which works in theory, but in reality, it does seem that a lot of people end up dead. Um, and, I don't know. So, so I, at an individual level, I'm totally with you that kind of, that, 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 that I think I probably trust most of the guys in this room to totally optimize on something that I would agree with. Now, question is, do I trust Intel to optimize on something I could agree with? <laughs> you know, because I got a feeling that, well, and we've talked a lot in our time together about, about the challenges that a corporation lives under. Um, and as we look to the future, kind of how do we, how, how do you, how do you think about kind of the responsibility of, of the power involved in a company able to set in motion a series of things that may end up with a set of consequences that possibly none of us would have chosen when we were picking to optimize? Right. So the first thing you always have to remember, right, technology doesn't get to decide, right? Technology mm -hmm. doesn't get to decide what it does, people decide. Yeah, so it's exactly. not, right? And, and you can't design a hammer sufficient enough to drive a nail that's not sufficient enough to bash in somebody's head. Mm -hmm. You just can't. We have culture and laws around that to say, building a house with a hammer, good. Bashing mm -hmm. in a head, bad. You're not allowed to do that. So that's mm -hmm. step number one. Now when it comes to Intel, you know, one of the things that I would say that would make me, and the reason why I'm there, is mm -hmm. so you all met Douglas Rushkoff. So Doug likes to say that I'm a hack inside of Intel or I'm a virus. It's my job to actually go to them and say, here's the model of the future. Here's where things are going. Here's what people need. Here's what people want. And then to say, how do we go about using that to make people's lives better? This is sort of what I put to them. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I've been very impressed with, and I think for me the most recent example, as we go through and we talk about sustainability, is you see the company making very specific decisions, being very open about mm -hmm. a lot of that. And the, I mean, the most recent thing is our position on conflict minerals, that we actually see it that it's not sustainable, that you actually can't do that. Mm -hmm. So you do have a large corporation, and large corporations, I do not believe, are inherently evil. They're actually mm -hmm. full of very good people, but you have to be held accountable. And that was my whole idea about the humanity and the machine, is that even that that company, that company is made up of people, and people make decisions about where it's going, and they have to be held accountable. Okay. On a lighter note, did you see the movie Her? I did see the movie Her. <laughs> and what did you think of that? I love the movie Her. The reason why I love the movie Her is it gave us a completely new, and if you haven't seen it, I'm sorry, this is a big spoiler alert. So, um, it gave us a new idea of the singularity, right? So usually when we play Ask Me Anything, people always ask me about the singularity, right? The singularity is the moment at which machine intelligence surpasses human intelligence. Mm -hmm. What most people think is the moment that machine intelligence surpasses human intelligence, what will happen is the machines will rise up and kill us all. This actually says more things about humanity than it does about the machines. Mm -hmm. What I love about her is what they say is machines, when machines get, when machine intelligence surpasses human intelligence, they don't kill us all, they break up with us. <laughs> and it's a very, very difficult thing for human beings to deal with. We think we're very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, Carl Sagan has a great quote that says, it's very hard for us to understand that we are not the central actor in this drama. Mm -hmm. That everything is usually always about us. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times the, uh, the singularity, um, that notion of machines and machine intelligence and that sort of scariness is usually a, a bigger reflection on ourselves and our own flaws more than the technology. Jeez, I hope the future, the, the, it sounds like uh, Scarlett Johansson, I guess. That would be something to look forward to. Well, it should, it should sound like that, but it should look like my, my other slide, right? All messy yeah. and all stuff everywhere. Okay, another question. They're flooding in. Skynet for or against? <laughs> this goes back to where Skynet is, is from the Terminator series. So again, the, the thing that you usually find about artificial intelligence and things like Skynet, you know, I, I, let's be clear, I'm not for the extinction of the human race. I didn't say that, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. uh, what Skynet, the notion of, again, artificial intelligence and this notion that artificial intelligence goes out, when we talk about intelligence, usually we're not in things like Skynet or things like science fiction, we're not actually talking about real artificial intelligence. I build robots, I build mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. It's not like that. 
that again, as we go out and build it again, we're in control and the type of intelligence that we're building. So oftentimes when you look at um, science fiction, what you're seeing is human beings playing out their own demons on the backs of mm -hmm. technology. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, so when, you, when you try and step away from our human tendency then to project onto technology, our fears, technology in the future, how do you look for trends? I mean, where do, they, where, where, where do you look for, for evidence to think about, about what the future might look like as you do your future casting so, stuff? So typically where I, I start is social science. So I work with ethnographers and anthropologists who get an understanding of human beings. Mm -hmm. Not trends, not demographics, but actually humans, like how they live and shop and fall in love and die. That's the first part. So again, it's always about humans. And that's actually why I came to Intel over a decade ago, is they have this long history of that. And then I start asking myself, OK, well, where do we see technology going? What's possible? I I'm literally just came back from, um, from a trip over in Tel Aviv, Israel, where we have a design center where I was starting the work for 2025. Mm -hmm. So we have a pretty good idea of where it's going in 2025. So we say, how do we take all of that intelligence and make people's lives better? That's, and it really is a design, it's a, it's a driving design principle for the work that we do, is to say, how, how are we going to use all this intelligence to make people's lives more productive, more entertained? That's what I look for. So I don't really look at trends. I don't really track trends. What I try to do is say, what can we do around people and then also, what might the world look like? But anybody who lived through 2008 knows that trends are kind of worth you know, what the paper it's printed on. Oh. Um, so I usually bet on people. So my first job after graduate school was a project for the Ladies Home Journal magazine. And we were supposed to help them think about what their business was going to be like. This was more years ago than I would care to admit. But our basic conclusion was that, of course, magazines as we knew it were not going to exist for very much longer. Now, I know I look very youthful, but that was actually quite a long time ago, many decades, right? And the last time I checked, magazines were going gangbusters, right? Probably better than ever. H how do you check yourself, right? As, as, you, as you imagine these different futures, we were all very sure, a group of theoretically intelligent people gathered a lot of data and talked to a lot of people and thought a lot about it and actually decided, you know, this, this, was, this was a high probability event. We were dead wrong. How do you guard against that? Well, there's, I think there's two bits to it. <clears throat> the first is we create, when we look out and we say we think the future is roughly going this way, and we say this is the future we want, this is the future we want to avoid, one of the things that this future casting process does is it actually embraces uncertainty. That's one of the things that I, I teach strategic foresight. And what we say is that we know that there's a high degree of uncertainty, but we actually embrace that uncertainty. We know that it will change. Mm -hmm. But that's a good thing. Actually, in that uncertainty is where innovation happens. If you knew everything that was going to happen, everything was set, it'd be really, really boring. Mm -hmm. But still, at the same time, I have to write a spec. It has to be very pragmatic. So in the backcasting work that we do, we actually create flags. We actually create markers that say, you know, if we're looking out to 2025, then we believe this thing will happen by 2017. And we believe this thing will happen by you know, 2020. And if it hasn't, we have to hold ourselves accountable. And then the other thing that I do simply because, again, if you've ever worked or been around an engineer or engineering company, it's very, very you know, driven by the spec. I write constantly. Yeah. And so I actually also put it out there. So I usually do about a book a year that says, here's where we see things going. And I'm held very accountable, usually, by the press of what I get right and yeah. what I get wrong. Yeah. So I hear you saying there's almost, it's like an ability to identify a set of signals that you want to pay attention to, and then kind of very carefully listen to what's happening as those signals evolve in the near term? How do you pick which signals? What, what to, I mean, surely in this world of so much information, you've got so much stimuli to help you think about it. How do you narrow it down without worrying that you're missing the, you know, the one thing that's small now, but if you'd caught it, might have made a difference in your ability to? And so that's what I spend most of my time doing. So I've been doing this for about 20 years. I've been at Intel for over 10 years. Um, and my students ask me that all the time. And I'm, it is my job to prove myself wrong. If, if what gets my attention is when somebody doesn't agree with me, is I'm always trying to break the model. That's always what I'm trying to do, is trying to figure out where am I wrong, how is it wrong, and try to find people. I actually seek people out. Yes, if you, if you, want, if you want me to think that you like me, tell me you don't agree with me. I'll be like, awesome, why? Mm -hmm. Because that's, the, I think, the goal. The goal isn't to, to be right. 
Like what drives me is not to be the person who sits up here and goes, well, you know, I said this and this was it and I was right. I don't care about that. The goal is to get it right, right? The goal is to create technologies, to create products, and to have design experiences that touch people and to make their lives better. And that's the bar of success. So it's the role of disconfirming data. Again, the dog that didn't bark in the night comes mm -hmm. back. Well, maybe one last question, and I, and, and I don't know to what extent you can talk about this, but, but I think one of the things that, that troubles us most, and we talked a little bit about it this morning, is this idea that probably those of us in this room are all in pretty good shape when singularity happens, and we need a lot less people to do things because machines will do them for us. What's the conversation like in Intel about how we as a society prepare for that? I mean, what, What's the conversation about how we're going to help all of the people who will theoretically get replaced by machines in their, in their work? Well, I, I, do, I do subscribe to right, what David Kelly says, is that if a machine or a robot can take your job, your job probably sucked. Because it didn't embrace the humanness of who you were. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, is one side of it. But the reality is there's a lot of people right, who, OK, yeah. your job might have sucked, but your paycheck didn't. Exactly. Right? So that's a big deal. So one, a lot of the conversations that we're having inside of Intel, and actually my, my next piece that I'm doing, my next book that I'm writing is called What's the Future of the American Dream? Mm -hmm. That's taking on that head on, like going at it and saying when it comes to education, when it comes to manufacturing, where, where are we going? And it's a big conversation we have, and it usually goes back to education. And not only education when it comes to our normal education, but how we think of education in general. And what I mean by that, is we have typically come out, and I, I love the presentation before about the education system. We, you, you, won't, you won't know this, but some of you might know this. If you, that you may know what a thing called a record, or a 45 record. You're too young to understand yeah. this stuff. <clears throat> so you Such have a, a record, charmer. and so a record. It was this thing. It was sometimes made of wax or I wax or plastic. I remember 78s. I'll yeah. have you know. And you could you would stamp it, right? And so you would sort of be stamped. And so you'd be a Bruce Springsteen song, or you'd be a Jay, Jay Giles band song. I was my first 45, by the way. Jay Giles band song. And so you had you were stamped it, right? And you were awesome, and you would listen to that. And but that's all you were. And we've learned, in, and that's in the education system, what people have said is you're a doctor, or you're a lawyer, or you're a designer. Mm -hmm. And that's what our education system is set up. And it's actually how we think of ourselves, or a lot of people think of themselves. But what the digital world has taught us is that's not true, right? That we take songs, and songs get pulled apart and put back together, and they're much more reconfigurable. And that we need to think about ourselves and think about education, not as these things that sort of get stamped and done. They go, like, OK, OK, and now I'm a designer, and I can go design, that we're what we do is variable and will continue to change. And that's one of the things when I go to young folks and talk to them, right? Mm -hmm. For my generation, which I'm Generation X, you would say, you will have four careers in your lifetime. And a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, four careers. For a lot of you out there, you're probably going, ew, four careers, that would be awful. I want more than four careers. And I think that's what we want, is this incredible, insatiable curiosity. And it's that curiosity is sort of how we can, if we create that culture, where you, people don't get outmoded. All of a sudden, you're not just this record that's become outmoded, that we have to change our education system, and even how we think about culturally education. OK. Right. Well, it's been terrific talking to you. We, we have to know where we can contact you in case you turn out to be wrong about the future, though. We're really important to that. Intel Futurist. I'm okay. Intel Futurist. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Thank you. Great.